Hello everybody, it's Tim again. Uh, today we're working on a McCullough chainsaw and it's a, a relic here. It's from 1990-91 that era. What I have here on the bench is a uh, coil, an ignition coil from a similar chainsaw and I believe that's the problem with the one I have. Actually the problem I have with the one I'm working on right now is the uh, the wire for the spark plug, everything, it's just destroyed from all the heat from the engine and the oil and everything that gets on it. I can take you down, I'll show you that. But anyhow, I took it apart, and as I was taking it apart, I found that. It was one of those deals where I went to put a spark plug in it, and then I, from that point, everything just went downhill. So that's why I didn't video it, take it apart. But now that it's apart, we'll go down and take a look. It's actually in the garage, but a couple things I wanted to say about this. Uh, this coil here I replaced on a very similar chainsaw probably about 20 years ago and I kept it. And the reason I kept this was uh, the chainsaw was only a couple hours old, you know, runtime. And I always remembered that saying you used to see on the old televisions that say do not open up qualified service technicians, no user serviceable parts inside. And I thought about that when I was taking the chainsaw apart, so I didn't take it apart until I ordered a new coil. I ordered a new coil, took it apart, and I found that one of the wires that actually, well, I guess it was assembled from the factory, one of the wires that runs to the ground switch for this was actually smashed in the frame, and that was causing the ground, and that's why when it got hot it died. Uh, but since I'd already bought the coil, I put it in. Uh, so I kept this one, and I just always thought about that, you know, no user, user serviceable parts inside. So I bought it up front, and Back then, it probably only cost about 12 or 15 bucks. Today, I can't even find one of these anymore. And uh, that's one of the main reasons I'm putting this on the video is uh, so I'll have it for forever. But this is a SEM Walbro is the manufacturer. And it's a Type AM32, it says in there. And these numbers here, I'm not sure what they correspond to, but I would imagine that 0991 is the date. But anyhow, what I was going to do is check it real quick and show you what I've come up with with this. And uh, coils are pretty interesting things, and basically that's all they are, is they're two coils. And in this instance, since it has a, a magneto, which means it's a magnet in the flywheel, uh, it has one coil, and the other coil is attached basically to this right here, this, this iron, which will act as the pickup. And we'll take a look at that later. But on your car, they may have two coils, and, and one coil back in the old days was attached to... Uh, a set of points that would open and close and every time the points closed they charged the coil and every time they opened they discharged it rapidly and when you discharge a coil rapidly it transfers over into a rapid discharge of the uh, secondary coil which is at the spark plugs and that's what makes the big spark. It's not that it has voltage all the time, it's every time the points open it causes a high voltage to transfer to the other side of the coil. There's two coils, a primary and secondary, they're not physically touching uh, so when you open and create a large voltage on the primary, you create a really large voltage on the secondary, and that's why the spark jumps over the gap and the spark plug and blah, blah, blah. Anyhow, same thing here, except this has a coil, and the other coil is attached to this, not to a set of points. And I'll kind of show you what I mean. But first thing I want to do is just check it. So what all, I'm, all I'm looking for is that there's some type of continuity and the secondary of this, which the secondary would be the spark plug side. So I'll just check, I'll check that, and it would be one of the grounds here. So we get that. Oh, I got it on voltage. Um, 2.2 K ohm. That's probably pretty good. It's not an open, it's not a short. And uh, I don't know exactly what it should be, but it's going to be a little bit high. So that tells me it's good. So if I really want to check the coil and see if it works, uh, what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the coil and we're going to connect the spark plug side of it to the oscilloscope. And I'm going to take a little magnet and I'm going to take a little magnet and I'm going to go in and out with this and I'll show you on the scope what happens when I do that. Uh, how it induces a voltage inside this and makes a big voltage on that side. And, and uh, Right here, you might notice the little, uh-oh, 
might notice the little red lead on my uh, meter. Oh, I put that little uh, insulation there. And that's good if you're doing these when you go to uh, test something. And you may have to reach inside and have other components by. I just like to have the tip of it exposed so when I touch something I don't short it. That's, that's what that's all about. Uh, I find that's very helpful. Again, like I said, when you're working with things and, and these leads are a little bit on the big side for like some of the uh, surface mount or IC stuff, so that helps me keep from jabbing other things. So while I set this up real quick, let me put you on pause. Okay, so what I have is I have the scope. Uh, let me show you how I have it hooked up. That wire just goes so that I have something to put inside the spark plug hole and the positive end of the scope's on that and the negative end of the scope just goes to that wire that's on the coil. So you'll see here's I'm holding the coil in my hand and you see on the TV, the TV on the uh, scope, watch when I move a magnet close by it. Watch what happens when I move it magnet faster. I'm on the voltage scale too so I can make it even bigger. So you can see how a little uh, change makes that. So the magneto or the flywheel on the engine has one little magnet on it and every time it spins past it, book, book, it makes just like that. Every time it spins past it, it makes the spark. So anyhow, that's testing this. Now the only thing is, is if this was to fail when it gets really hot, I can't really tell that other than if I would just sit here and heat it up. So anyhow, we'll go down and take a look and see. Uh, that's just me now messing with the leads, as you can see. We'll go down and take a look at the uh, chainsaw. Okay, there's the chainsaw. You may be saying to yourself, this doesn't really resemble a chainsaw. Well, wouldn't you know it, in order to get to the uh, coil, you have to practically rip everything apart. So, uh, when we put it together, you'll see it looks more like one, but we'll take a look. Let me zoom in here. Come on, there we go. Nice focus. Okay, so you can see here's the coil. And I'm going to point the things. So I'll turn the monitor around so I can see what I'm looking at. Here's the coil right here. And it looks like it's going to be a almost an exact replacement for that. I have to see if I can find out. There will be a little bit of a gap because you don't want the uh, you don't want this to rub. So it has to be a little bit away. And as you saw with me when I had the magnet, I'm sorry if I can show you what doesn't what we don't want to rub. Uh, you don't want this to rub. Uh, and remember, as I had the magnet, I didn't even have to really get that close to it. So you use a uh, non-ferrous or non-magnetic uh, feeler gauge and give yourself a little bit of a gap there. I'll have to see, I'll have to look it up and see if I have any listing on what it should be. Uh, and that allows air between the, uh, the flywheel and the uh, coil. So let me see if, okay, you still got a good view. So I'm going to spin this around for a second and see where is our magnet. It's probably this whole area right here. And I can prove that by getting something like a screwdriver. Side does not feel magnetic, so let me spin it around. There we go. That's the magnetic side. That, the other side is just to balance it so I can actually see the magnet inserts into this now because this is aluminum with magnet inserts. Uh, so that, that looks like that's going to fit nicely. I'll see if I can find the, uh, the wire and show you what I mean. It 
if you can see, let me move this over so you can see what I'm seeing right here. The wire's all smashed in and it's, it's all, it doesn't feel solid anymore. It feels kind of gummy. So I'm definitely going to replace that. It, the, uh, the chainsaw was harder and harder to start, especially once it would get hot. And uh, if you'd move around the plug wire, it would start up. So as I can, as I see, that's all ripped up. That is an integral part of the coil, as you can see. Oh, <laughs> I have to find out where you can see it. But yeah, that, that plug wire is actually part of it. So we'll throw that on, and once I get to, uh, once I find the specs for it, back back out. Once I find the specs for it, we'll throw that on. Start to put it back together. I already, here's the dog barking. I already kind of blew most of it out to get most of the dirt out. Uh, like I said, I didn't intend on going this far, but it went further and further. So we'll be back. Alrighty, moved it up onto the bench. Uh, the gap on this, I'm getting anywhere from 10 to 14, depending on what sites I look at. And uh, I just so happen to have a 10, let me see if you can see that, a 10 in uh, brass, so it wouldn't be magnetic. So I can see that on this side it, it fits, but here it's tight, so we're going to go for that. We're going to shoot it at about 10. And it's not as critical, it's more critical that you don't whack the uh, coil with the magnet. Uh, but yet you still want it as close as you possibly can be. So anyhow, these are Allen heads. It looks like 530 seconds should take care of that. So I'm going to pull these out. I know my hands are going to be in, a way, in the way for a lot of this. The, uh, the one ground wire underneath the uh, coil, it goes to one of these bolts. And then the, the wire for the switch should plug into the, uh, oops, the wire for the switch should actually plug into the uh, coil itself right up top here. So I'll pull. And I'll throw that on the ground that way. I know where it's at. Here we go. Forget that all the way off. I want to pull the wire off. There's that. Yep, you can still see it. Okay, and I can actually, well, once I get this off, I'll see what it looks like under there, and maybe we'll pause it while I put the other one on and tighten it up. Oh, this has all kind of gunk in it right there from over the years. Now, the gunk's not going to make it not get a magnetic signal, but it could build up in there and maybe something a little bit stronger than just the gunk could get stuck on it and start to scratch either the uh, magnets or hurt the coil itself. But I mean, it's not like you can get in there and clean it or anything. It's not like part of your regular maintenance. All right, so let me get the other one. Here's the other guy, and I have the dog with me. That's what that occasional whine sound is. Okay. Looks like this will just go on here, down below. Get the wire out of our way. And then. I'll get these bolts started and then I'll turn the camera back on when I, when I actually set the gap. 
something I did want to show is uh, the coil actually sits on a little shim of sorts. So make sure that you don't forget to put that on. It had fallen down and I put the coil on I thought that looks like it's sitting awful low. I didn't realize that it fell. So you'll see when you do get it, it's this part sits almost level with the top of the flywheel. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is set the gap when I'm not up to a magnet. So there is actually easier ways to do this. And you can actually get a... Uh, I saw a fellow on YouTube actually uses a part from a milk jug. So what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to use a thicker feeler gauge because it doesn't have to be uh, brass because I'm actually going to spin this around to where the magnet isn't. And then I'll use a, thick, a thicker feeler gauge, we'll say a 15 thousandths, and I'll tighten it that, and then I'll come back and check and see when I pull up to the, uh, the magnet if my 10 thousandths work. So there's 9. I don't see many feelers gauges these days. Alright, there's... 16, that seems a little thick, but we'll shoot the 16th in, and I'll snug it up. Yeah, it would be, uh, I've always wanted to try that with the plastic. Actually, that seems like a good idea, like it would work pretty well. But I just never seem to have anything that I can use, like a milk jug when I'm down here. And right. Let's see what that does. That started with 16 thousands. We'll spin it around again to the magnet. One other thing I want to add. I did not, but I recommend you take the spark plug out when you do it. It'll make life a little easier to spin it. All right, tens tight, but it fits there, but still doesn't fit on this side. So as you can see, it's kind of like one of those things where I'm going to be going back and forth. So I'm going to pause it until I get it, and then we'll come back. Okay, so what I ended up doing is, uh, and it's fine for doing the install, but if you want to check it, you definitely need something that's brass or plastic or I'm going to fit that in there so you can see. Uh, I actually set it with a 12 thousandths feeler's gauge in there and then I pulled it back out. Again, like I said, I'm doing it at the magnetic part. And after it was all tight, the 12, the 10 thousand fits in there nice. The, uh, you know, of course the, the 12 gets practically smashed in there, it's a little bit hard to get it out. But that's what you can do is set it a little bit bigger on the magnetic side and then when you spin it around again, it'll be fine. So. Well, yeah, once you pull it out, I mean, you'll be you'll be able to check it, and it'll be right right about where it should be. And again, it's not as detrimental; it doesn't have to be spot on, but you definitely want to make sure that it's not going to hit anywhere. That's the most important part, and that's why I say it's better if you take the spark plugs out. So, don't be a Tim. All right, so. Put this back on, and the next thing I have to do is fumble around with getting the wires where they have to be, the uh, high tension wire, the secondary wire, the one that goes to the spark plug. i got to route that and then put the bottom on, so I'll tune back in when we're ready to do some more stuff. Okay, so a couple other things. 
uh, watching the dog knock everything over out there, is um, this carburetor. It's got a fuel inlet down here, and it's got a rubber hose that goes to the fuel or to the carburetor, and then it's also got the uh, the throttle uh, cable up top. So you have to kind of watch. It's like putting together a puzzle, getting that all on. Something else that I like to do is I like to put a uh, something inside the carburetor hole so that I don't have to worry about anything falling in there. Okay, so now we're about ready to try and put the uh, top part back on, so I'll pull that out of there. This will be a little bit of a picnic because I have to do about five things at one time. I gotta get the carburetor lined up and then I have to get this hose behind it so I hopefully can do that. Um, but let me make sure of one thing first. I'm not too much of a hurry to film. Okay, I got that on there. I wanted to make sure that I put the, uh, the wire back on. Or that would really be a pain. So anyhow, as you can see, I don't know if you can see or not, but this rubber pipe has to go on behind here. And at the same time, the carburetor's kind of got to match up so that it can go onto the manifold. And it doesn't look like it's going to be that much of a pain, but you got all this other stuff to deal with, so... That's on. I'll set it on its, on its little side. And... Looks like the manifold's pretty close to lining up. So the carburetor should be next. Make sure that nothing slid down in there dirt-wise. The manifold actually has kind of a rubber gasket that fits up against this piece of plastic. So, we'll take a look at that. Alright, and I'll turn it on when something else exciting happens. I gotta put the bottom part in too and run the wire. Okay, got that on. There's a uh, gasket. It's part of the manifold. It's rubber. It has a little extrusion that sticks up through the plastic here like I was saying before and uh, that you can kind of you can jiggle around with your fingers or work a screwdriver up in there to get it through that's what you want to make sure you get through but we're almost ready for that uh, I just wanted to get it kind of lined up and tell you about it so the next part is this is the uh, the bottom of the, the saw I have the the line for the coil it runs there's a little groove on top of the fuel tank see if I can show you where it runs right there it fits right in there nice and uh, so then this will go up once I get this on the will start to bolt things back together and uh, then we'll do the final lineup of the carburetor and then the bolts that actually hold the the air cleaner adapter on actually are the same bolts that uh, go all the way through and hold the carburetor in okay yeah we're still recording okay uh, so it's starting to look more like a, well, I'm going to say chainsaw, but more like an engine. So I got all these parts on, and I'm just snugging them up right now. Because like I said, it's like, this is like putting together a Rubik's Cube. Everything has to line up. So, looks like the next doodad's going to be to get the carburetor lined up. And I don't know if you can see in here. Inside, oh, there's where the gasket sticks through in there. Is my hand on the way? And you have to make sure that that sticks up through, and it will because it 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 it's pliable. But once you put uh, the bottom cover on, it makes it a little harder to get in there and move it, move it around. Alrighty, so there's that, and I'm gonna put the fuel lines back on because they kind of got knocked off a little bit. But you can get it, to get them from the top. So let me pause it until something more exciting happens. I'll put these screws in too to hold hold it on, and uh, then we'll be coming in the home stretch. The last will be to bolt up the carburetor. Okay, and then more of the uh, puzzle. The idea is. You've got to get this on, 
This is the choke, and at the same time, there's a little little bell kind of thing here that fits underneath and acts as the throttle lock. So you got to get that on. Let's see, and uh, that way, when you do all that at one time, you got the throttle lock. You got that. It's a little bit. It can be done, but just one should be aware of if you're doing it. You got to get that. I got to clean that off yet, but this will go up and kind of lock the throttle lot. So when you go to do the car, the uh, cold start, that'll work. So you'll check that when you're done. And there's a little shouldered, where's a little shouldered bolt here, and that goes underneath the choke blade. So at the same time, like I said, you're trying to get that carburetor, the uh, the gasket part of the manifold lined up all at the same time. But work gingerly, and everything will fall into place. Don't try and force things. Probably thinking more like this. Because if you saw it was, there's no way it could sit on top of that. Since it wasn't pre-bent or anything, there's no way it would have been able to sit on top of that and work normal. So again, doing the same thing. Just run the screws in and gently work them back and forth. There we go, that choke feels still tight, but it feels nice and smooth. But this has a, uh, there's a spacer underneath it, so hopefully that would work. And just the way it's bent, yeah, just the way it's bent, it acts like a spring action, so to keep the choke from vibrating on or off. Let's make sure this still works, that still works, everything there appears to be lined up. Tighten down a little bit more on these screws. Okay, so let me torque down a little bit more on this, this, this. There's two in the front, and then the ones at the two at the bottom. Then we'll be ready to stick the side cover on. Alrighty, get the sides tightened. Got the uh, the pull part. Uh, Pull, uh, pull handle assembly in, back on. Uh, everything here seems to work. Connect up the spark plug. Spark. I know that's connected and uh, it should start so let's give it a try. Uh, with this it's pretty easy. Just make sure it's on run and it has a throttle lock and I guess we'll give it a little bit of choke because it's fully cold because it hasn't been started. I did uh, uh, run some fuel through it, so... Jeez. All right, well, I'm gonna give it a try real quick. We'll see how it works. Okay, well, there it is, and it started and it ran. It cut pretty good. It's got a new blade. Uh, new bar. The old coil works well and I actually saved the other one. Maybe I can find a way to replace that wire because that coil is no longer available. Uh, I don't know if there's maybe something else that will work in its place. Uh, what else? New spark plug. Uh, oh and I, I did replace the fuel line just because I was in there and, and I had one. So I replaced the fuel line and the fuel filter and like I said I got a spark plug so all in all, it looks like uh, this has been the chainsaw that worked fine until I went to fix one thing on it and then I ended up having to replace everything. But it seems to run really good now and cut really good, so maybe we'll get another 30 years out of it. Thanks for watching.